Today, I want to welcome Mike Horn, Dr. Horn. He helps aspiring leaders and executives move from possibility to probability, whether they're facing career transitions, learning to scale in a new role, or increasing their effectiveness and influence. Mike coaches with focus on goal-directed behaviors that create improvements and sustain progress. He helps his clients to capitalize on their strengths, to catalyze new success behaviors, and to condition themselves for continued growth and progress. Mike is the host of a top-rated podcast known as the Authentic Change Podcast. He's also the author of Integrity by Design. Mike, welcome to Leaders and Legacies. Thanks, Craig. Uh, it's, uh, I'm so delighted to be a uh, guest on your show, Leaders and Legacies. Yeah, so I yeah, so let's take us back in time a little bit. Um you um well actually let's let's kind of start at the end and then we're going to go back. Specifically, how do you help people and help organizations uh in your current role? Well, first I'd like to just unpack that word help <laughs> because for a lot of people it carries uh some luggage or some baggage and what does it mean to help? And uh, for me, I fully embrace it. Um, I, that is what I've been doing for a good part of my uh, career as a coach, as a teacher, as a mentor. It's to uh, help a a a people with their ideas, with their uh, stepping into their potential and bringing more of who they are to what they do. And I have the good fortune of doing that with um, executives in the C-suite uh, C leaders or leaders, uh, primarily in research, uh, in science and technology and engineering. That's my, uh, client world providing and helping, uh, those individuals with their personal and professional development, as well as their team and organization development. So my helping today as coach, mentor, and teacher is fulfilling my, life and all of those as a coach you know again i i help uh, uh leaders in the c-suite with um uh the issues uh, i like to work with really smart people that's essentially you know what i get working with scientists and engineers and technologists um and uh, as a teacher i teach at golden gate university i'm chair of the human resources uh, graduate human resources management program the graduate program in uh leadership studies uh, and uh, I have several select mentoring opportunities that I'm engaged in right now as well. Well, cool. And that's so, what I've done throughout my career, you know, whether it's been here in the U.S., whether it was uh, in another part of the world, it, it's been this pathway of uh, helping people with their executive and organizational challenges. Very cool. So that's where you are now. Take us back to where where you started. Where, where are you from? And what you know what sent you on this path originally well i I'm, i think it's always been a natural curiosity about people and social systems if i think about my earliest job experiences my earliest uh, career experiences there are two that always stand out in mind i used to go uh, door to door uh, as a teenager for the gallup opinion research corporation you know asking questions to people in suburban neighborhoods and my other formative uh, work experience was working with Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta in the uh, Let Us Boycotts, uh, and that was a very fundamental way of thinking about it. Led me to an early career in labor management relations. Uh, I mean, that's really kind of a boring field. Uh, in many ways, it's really shifted and shaped as uh, unions uh, lost their stature in the United States. Um, moved into employee relations, but I never really wanted to be involved in what I thought was um, this dichotomous, this drift between labor and management. So much more fun to be in organization development, working with uh, vision and mission and purpose and goals. So did you grow up in California? No, I grew up in Western Pennsylvania. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Well, okay. Like uh, Pittsburgh or surrounding? Yes, Pittsburgh? yes, yes. Okay. Uh, and so you grew up, you know, so the transition that was happening then was, uh, I would imagine you were seeing the, the 
fall off of the steel industry and, and that area go through a little bit of a dip, an economic dip? I don't know. You know, as a child, I, I was sort of immune from economic dips or, you know, wealth or poverty. I didn't, you know, know better. I am certain that, uh, you know, all of that was underway. I mean, I'm sure it could wait to history and uh, know that that was all underway at that period of time. Sure. Uh, well, I remember and- the city being dirty, uh, yeah. smoky. Um, yeah, I, I went to, there's a museum on top of Mount Washington, and I saw pictures where it looked like midnight in the middle of the day. There was so much soot in the air. Yes, I don't recall that, but I have seen photographs to uh, to that effect. Wow, and and it's today it's a beautiful, beautiful city. So, how did you go from that to getting connected with Cesar Chavez? Well, um, I think the strategy of the UFW, the United Farm Workers Union, at that point point was they organized a number of uh, boycott houses across the United States. Pittsburgh was a labor friendly town. Uh, and certainly, you know, people created and donated space for, uh, uh, the UFW to have a headquarters there. It was during the giant, uh, giant, giant for the UFW, uh, the giant boycott of AMP foods. So, you know, it was a place to organize, to, uh, you know, organize, yeah, to organize, to get ready to pick it, uh, to protest. And, you know, I, 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 luckily I had the good fortune of, you know, meeting Caesar as a teenager and interacting with him and also Dolores Huerta. You know, and there, there's a lot of people who don't know who he was, except there's often some street in their town. I live in Austin and we have a Cesar, uh, you know, Chavez Boulevard. Who was he? What did he do? What, what, why is his name meaningful? Well, it's probably not a question I am prepared or competent enough uh, to answer, though I can, you know, put it in some of the uh, words that I know. Uh, he was uh, born in Arizona. I think family eventually uh, moved to California. He served in the Navy or the Army, one of the branches of the service. Uh, he came back. Uh, he took an organizing course. Uh, he led, uh, you know, essentially uh, the changeover of, um, you know, a lot of migrant farm worker labor. I think identified, you know, for many Mexican Americans and other uh, Latinos as, uh, you know, an important figure like uh, King or Kennedy. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, Caesar and obviously... was uh, very, uh, you know, uh, Caesar was uh, uh, went on a number of hunger strikes. And I think that sort of propelled some of his uh, fame and popularity. But I think it was, uh, you know, a diehard allegiance to improve the life of the campus, you know. Okay. So you go from working with him to now you're in the tech industry uh helping you know develop leadership there how how did you get from there to to where you are well i think you know one theme uh that runs throughout my career is i've always worked with powerful people or people who had a lot of uh uh claim on their power top executives uh in you know big global corporations uh, have often been my clients or the people uh, i was lucky enough to work for so I think that, um, you know, I have some unique gifts, You, as you may have been asking earlier, pre-show notes, um, in terms of doing what the best in my field have ever done. And I, you know, I think about that as uh, Doug McGregor, or Edie Seashore, and that is that um, we listen really, really, really well. And then maybe during the course of our engagement, we have a good idea (laughs) and we offer it. And, uh, you know, that can change the direction of an executive's life. It can chart the course of uh, a business. But, um, 
what I do in the tradition of, uh, I think some of the best in organization development as I am a exceptional listener. So, um, can we put some meat on that? I mean, can you give an example? Obviously we don't, you know, you know, want to be too personalized, but what, what's an example of being able to listen extremely well and then turn that listening into a profound change? change in somebody's uh, the tra trajectory of someone's life. Well, I think there's so many things that uh, come into play in that regard, but certainly I would consider two things to be important. One is self-awareness, uh, being clear about your values and who you are and comfortable in your own skin. And then secondly, I think it's uh, using that sense of self uh, uh, and moving it into agency. So I think those are the two factors. It's from uh, understanding uh, self to um, agency. And, w and what's that mean when you say moving in into agency? Well, agentic behavior that you can actualize the things that are important to you uh, in working with uh, teams and groups and individuals and organizations. Mm. Okay. You can make you, it happen. How about that? Yeah. No, uh, you, make, no. you can make your values happen. <laughs> can you think of an example that, you know, like a, something very specific where, you know, the the trajectory of, of an executive's whole career changed and in and, and turn changed those that followed him uh, through through your coaching? Many of the people that I uh, have the good fortune of working with and ha um, are trendsetters. They're groundbreakers. Uh, they they break new grounds in their field uh, in science and technology. Uh, maybe they're curing a certain disease. Maybe they're making an advance in technology that affects uh, you know all of us. Maybe they're thinking about uh, <clears throat> moves you know towards more plant plant based uh, foods and economies. Um, so I work with people who are generally doing some pretty amazing things, uh, in their sphere of influence. And, um, you know, what I know is that, you know, these people get attacked all the time and, uh, that makes them irritated, vulnerable, uh, angry. So the ability to listen through that. And then to, you know, chart a, a new course to bring hope, to bring discernment. I mean, I have a pretty good sense usually of helping people figure out what's work and what's not work. Let's discern that because a lot of stuff people worry about is not that important. Uh, so let's figure out what's the work here. Let's let let let, let me be present with you, <laughs> and then. You know, let's bring a sense of hope. Some people would call that a sense of heart, but I think it's about as more as hope that I bring a sense to executives that something can be different. Okay. Well, and, you know, the tech industry is really kind of an interesting one because, you know, the entry point into that industry is usually a, a very technical degree where you get hired for what you know. And then eventually, and, and you, you, move into a job and then you start advancing based on what you know and what you um are able to you know prove or reduce to practice but then as you move into leadership there are new skills required how do you see how do you see people navigating that as they move in from uh in their from their technical roles to the more leadership roles A lot of it depends on where the sphere of influence is. And, uh, you know, is it with your own team? Maybe, uh, you know, as a uh, leaders, uh, as a leader of leaders. Is it with your peer group? Is it with the executive team in the organization? You know, is it as a leader of your own organization? And I think so much of it changes depending on, uh, you know, what audience. And it does change by discipline as well. So I think, for example, in science, 
most of the scientific leaders that uh, I work with um, are collegial in nature. I mean, you really can't work in drug development without being collegial in nature. I mean, you have to bring a lot of people into, you know, a, a very big tent to develop a drug, chemists, biologists, you know, people, uh, people who have different levels of expertise, toxicologists, pharmacologists, uh, veterinarians, lots. So it's a very, it's a very collegial endeavor for those who succeed in technology. I mean, having, you know, counting, uh, you know, among my clients, uh, some of the most technical areas, uh, heads of information security at Facebook and other big companies, um, it's a different way of navigating the complexities of those worlds of, uh, technology and who's listening, particularly, you know, given the uh, recent, um, challenges in technology, it's a very squeezed market right now. Capital isn't there. I mean, it's a very squeezed market right now. So I think your question has a lot of nuances, you know, it depends on audience. It depends on what you're trying to do. Um, in terms of the exercise of leadership and where you sit in relationship to that. The, most of my clients, Craig, are people who are in some sort of transition or taking their teams through a transition or taking their organizations through a transition, maybe a redesign, for example, of a research and development department. Uh, you mentioned, I think you had a background in electrical engineering. Yeah, yeah, I just completed a redesign in a large medical device company of an R&D department that was essentially made up of double E's and M's and software engineers, a bunch of different kinds of engineers. And, and and what sort of challenges did you run into when you were doing that? Well, the challenge that I always like to describe in working in some of these highly technical areas, highly, which I work in a lot, is that you can host an ice cream social and people attend, but they only uh, attend to take the ice cream. So it's really how do you engage people in a developmental process uh, where they learn more about uh, leadership, they learn more about organization, and you're doing the best to uh, deliver value to customers. You know, there's a recent example in the news of, you know, leadership challenge, uh, organizational challenge in the the rapid firing and then rehiring of the uh, OpenAI CEO. And I, you know, I think at one point there were what, you know, 780 employees and 700 of them threatened to quit if they didn't bring back the CEO. That's unique in industries. Yes, I think it's very unusual, very unusual. So, I mean, if, it does if we, happen and it's very unusual. Yeah. But I, I think it exposes a broader issue there. I mean, leading a technical team like that of OpenAI um, is, is tough. I mean, it's a team that feels very empowered and very confident of their abilities independent of the organization. I think it goes back to your you know, earlier point, you know, the point that we were discussing about where's the level of focus. There are many leaders who survive votes of no confidence by employees and the board still retains them. There are many CEOs who everybody else on their team wishes they were gone, but because of perhaps some, you know, they brought the IP, the board retains them. So I've, I've watched, you know, and participated and been involved in these, you know, situations of votes of no confidence in leadership where leaders survive. As I said, you know, I think it's unusual. I think it's rare. It does happen. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about, uh, you've got a book titled Integrity by Design. What's what's that about? Uh, Integrity by Design is about bringing more of who you are to what you do. Uh, the subtitle is Working and Living Authentically. So it's a lot about congruency. It's a lot about can you... Uh, uh, do what you think and say. Uh, what I know, I mean, having served in so many organizations and among my current clients is that generally people like working for happy people. How does happiness arise? Happiness arises through congruency that, you know, I uh, 
do what I say and even better, you know, if I think the same thing is so I have an alignment in that regard. Gender creates happiness. That alignment creates happiness. People like working around other happy people. And uh, that's what that book is about. It's about how you go about doing that in a stepwise fashion about bringing more of who you are to what you do. Yeah. Well, excellent. And, and then you're, you, you have your podcast, the authentic change podcast, and you, uh, you say you're, you're getting ready to, uh, transition that what's, What's podcast? For all of the wonderful listeners of this show and those uh, you know who follow Authentic Change with Mike Horn, in January, 2024, we're rebranding to the People Dividend, and super excited about this. Uh, the People Dividend is, you know, I help leaders move into a space about creating organizations and teams focused on people-centered performance or working with individuals on people-centered performance, and that pays a dividend. It's a psychic dividend. And I'm really looking forward uh, to uh, continuing to meet with industry leaders about creating these people dividends and organizations through people-centered performance. Well, excellent. I hope people will tune into that. Um, Mike, I just, I want to thank you for being on Leaders and Legacies today, sharing it's a wonderful your insights. Craig. And um, yeah, uh, thanks again. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, I really love your audience to uh, come and visit me. I hope they see it in the show notes.